this video hopefully we're going to show how the card works I'm going to start by showing some of the tools that I used back then let's start with the Altera Max Plus 2 we look under the license manager and we can see all the options are enabled and again this is currently using the card for the dongle this selects the programmer that we want to use notice that uh, we could select the type of hardware in this case I would normally be using the master blaster with this card the hardware programming is already built into it and I have my own programmer that I wrote Metagraphics offered the Leonardo Spectrum synthesis tool for some of the different vendors this particular version of the software was written for the Lattice and I have another version that was actually written for the Altera Simplify also offered a vendor specific version for my schematic capture originally I was using ORCAD and we're talking about the DOS version once that was no longer supported I looked into using Protel and Protel actually allowed me to import all those files directly I actually have the uh, full-blown version of 3 I think it is you can see the outline of it these are the two FPGAs the RAM, the flash down here is the larger decoder FPGA and up here is the DRAM this is the display interface for the postcode diagnostics so when the PC boots this is the LED display that's shown on the front of the unit this is the bus interface down here would be the ISA bus this is the switch mode power supply this is the main decoder FPGA there's some switches up here to configure it this is our DRAM and RAM interface our I.O. port these are the two slave FPGAs this is the Xilinx version of their tools at the time this is version F2.1i both Xilinx and Altera allowed for some type of schematic entry I believe Lattice did as well typically what I was doing was a text based entry this is a very old version of Couple this was used for smaller devices CPLDs, PALs, GALs the language is kind of unique in that it's not really like the Verilog or the VHDL. This is WinRT. This is a driver development tool. Some of you probably remember with the older OS's like Windows 95, Windows 3.1, you had direct access to the hardware. Once Windows NT was released, that was no longer the case. And what this tool allowed you to do is create a very simple driver for your hardware to check it out. We can see I've designated an area at 100 and another area up at 3BC which happens to be a printer port. So in the first video I was showing this loopback connector and this plugs on the end of the ribbon cable. So we'll go ahead and install that. You can see the card has been identified at address 3BC and 100. It's using IRQ7 and it's using two of the 10K100 BQs. We can see the program has loaded up two special test cords and the two slave FPGAs. First test is checking the data bus. You can see both data buses passed on both slave devices. Next thing we do is we're going to test our loopback and this is the block that I just showed so that's been installed. and we can see that passed just fine, we tested the RS-232, that was fine next thing we're doing is we're looking at the slave clock 
So this is the frequency that's based off of another clock in the unit. This should be roughly uh, 32 kilohertz, and that's approximately correct. Now we're testing the 32 kilohertz on the secondary device, and it appears that is correct as well. I'm not sure if this is a problem or not. Um, it could be that this particular computer doesn't output this clock. I'm not even sure if I'm using this clock for the designs. So there's a phase lock loop that's on the board and we could generate up to 100 megahertz. This part was made by Paracom. Paracom, as some of you probably know, got bought out last summer. And we can see it's running roughly 100 megahertz. Next thing it checks the refresh cycle of the DRAM and next the address decode and finally it's doing pattern tests on the DRAM. Next it's checking the cache memory. Next we're checking the second slave FPGA's RAM. Okay, last test I think is this uh, flash memory. To program the card I've written a couple of different loaders. I've got this program called WinLoad that I wrote. If we have a look. So again I'm using the Blue Water WinRT driver. It's not a whole lot to this program. It just parses Intel hex records and just basically bit bangs them up to the port. I have an images directory here where I build up all the files for this. Tell you one thing, so I'm using this ball mouse with this old PC. Wow, talk about a big change to go to those optical mice. This thing keeps hanging up and I had cleaned it out just prior to starting to work on this video. So what I'm going to do is select Pong. So I just double click and you can see this starts up the loader. Telling you it was successful. Remember the I.O. board had a VGA port on it. So all this is being done inside of one of the uh, 10K100 devices. It's just some state machines that are driving the VGA port. This is programming up their game of life. One of the CPUs that I designed for this board is a 6801. That was a Motorola part. Although it ran at 4 megahertz, I had to divide by 4. That's a sys part, so yeah, the number of clocks are actually dependent on the opcode that was being executed. So in this particular program, this just exercises the opcodes for the 6801. And you can see here I'm using the Motorola macro assembler to actually build the program. The output of this will be a binary file that I'll then load into the device. This document defines how the microcode is constructed. This first part just defines all the opcodes for the 6801. You can see the opcodes here on the left. This is their hex equivalent, the number of clock cycles. And then to the far right is the description of each opcode. This table defines the 16 bits that make up the microcode. There are up to 32 different microcodes. This defines each microcode. If 
be stable to find the multiplexers which steer the data through the CPU. This is a few examples of some opcodes. So the no op for example. This would be increment the program counter and then return. If we say branch of carry clear for example, we'd increment the program counter, store the operand to OPA, increment the program counter, load the program counter with the PC relative if the carry is clear and then do a return. This last example shows the load accumulator A with extended data. At the bottom of this is a worksheet. So if you want to work this out by hand, which I was initially doing, programming the app codes by hand took a little bit of work. I ended up writing a microcode assembler. Basically what I do is I define each of the states and I also define the muxes. And then down below I would define each op code. Very similar approach. Not very complex because the instruction set really isn't all that difficult. Just looking at the FPGA test panel for the CPUs. So here I have uh, the data bus, the address bus, the index register, accumulator A, accumulator B, the zero, the equal, and the carry flags. The way you would run this would select the flash. And what we can do is program in the binary file that we just created, which is this test ops bin. This will program that file into the flash prom. Up here we can select which FPGA we want to program. So in this case what we're going to do is load the 6801. There's two synthesizers on the board. This first one is a 1 megahertz synthesizer. So for example, if I want to put out 10 hertz, I just type in 10. And here we can see the program actually executing. Selecting the reset, reset our address counter. To the right here we can see the different registers as the program executes. If I want to speed this up. So this is currently running the device at 1 megahertz. There is a secondary synthesizer. This is currently running at 1 megahertz. Here's a 2. Here's at 10, here's 20, oh, here she crashed. It's about the upper limit, it's about 25 megahertz on this particular design. So that's it for this demo, hope you enjoyed it.